The second person I would like to um, bring up is um, Francesco Arese Visconti, who is our extremely talented uh, head of photography. He does an amazing range of projects, and this one I love because it combines the best. It's in terms of interdisciplinary working with um, psychology and other studies, he has managed to visualize things that are in reports, and I'll let him discuss the nature of his very wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. Does it work? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Well, now, I mean, even without a microphone. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for, for being here. And, um, so this is my, uh, I'm a photographer, a documentary photographer, and uh, in the last two years, can we dim the light a bit? Because I think it's too bright. Um, in the last two years, I've been working on uh, the Italian-Chinese community in Prato. You heard something about that yesterday, because I'm working with uh, Betty Sacco. And um, before I start showing actually the photographs, I want to uh, give you an idea on how uh, an image can be powerful, but also misunderstood or misinterpreted. And you see the image on the right hand side taken by Jürgen Strupp in May 1943. I'm sure most of you know it. It's the Warsaw uh, child. And uh, generally speaking, especially in these years, it's been considered one of the uh, symbols of um, an icon of an anti Nazism action. Actually, Jürgen Strupp was a Nazi, a Nazi commander. And uh, it was taken just to show how the action of the Nazis was powerful and good. So, in, according to them, of course. So, this image has been widely misinterpreted. Uh, so, when we take photographs and we analyze um, subjects and topics, we have to be very, very uh, attentive and pay a lot of attention to what we are producing. Uh, there on the left, you have the names of the four photographers that got inspiration from, especially for the work you've seen displayed outside of this room called the Prato. Walker Evans, August Sander, Chauncey Hare, and Irwin Penn. Most, I mean, all of them connected um, because they were documentary photographers. What does it mean? Documentary photography, as Walker Evans said, is, has to be precisely measured, frontal, unemotional, dryly textured, and to work in series in a um, on the same topic. So here we have, very quickly, because I have just 10 minutes, so, uh, Walker Evans, August Sander work, Chauncey Hare, and Irwin Penn. You can see the connection of the four photographers. Uh, so, as I said before, in the last two years, I worked on um, the Chinese community, Italian and Chinese community, in connection. Uh, one of the two projects is called Hidden Identity, and that's the project uh, Betty Sacco spoke about yesterday. And it's mainly an overview on the situation in Prato and this new identity created uh, by the, I would say, the, the, the mixture of the two communities. We have an Italian community and a Chinese community, but at the moment they get in touch, we create a new community. And it's not understood that it's visible to everybody. It's called, that's how I call it, hidden identity. On the right hand side you see We Prato, and uh, this is one of the images you see displayed outside. And it's mainly connected to the young generation. So this uh, Italian Chinese, uh, well the Chinese origin uh, young people and their peers of Italian origins. And see the connections between uh, them, uh, because basically they are all from Prato. They are the same community. The second project actually started a lot after the first one. So I would say it's like a, the son of the first project. So this is um, one image from the first one and this is from the second one. Why did I focus my attention on Prato? We saw some of these numbers yesterday, but I want to repeat them because it's quite impressive. Prato has uh, uh, officially, according to the official data, the 7.86% uh, of Chinese population. But unofficial data say that actually there are about 60,000 people in Prato, which is, has an impact of 31.4% on the entire population. If you see it compared to London, Paris, and Madrid, that's actually pretty intense and uh, remarkable. Why Prato? Why did they move to Prato uh, from China? Uh, in the 80s, uh, they started moving after the borders been opened. 
And they moved to Prato because uh, they are uh, basically family-run businesses. So they found more or less um, the same kind of environment, uh, I would say industrial environment. So Prato, people from Prato used to live, and they still live in a way, with their businesses next to their houses, so warehouses. And uh, the Chinese people came from Wanju, the Fujian uh, region. They were used to more or less the same kind of um, situation. The flexibility of work. People from Prato are hard workers. Uh, we are talking about human rights. and uh, People from Prato used to work even 12 hours a day, especially after World War II. And in the 60s, what we have in the 60s, when we had this big flux of migrants from the south of Italy to Prato, they started to work in the same way the Chinese people, I would say not exactly in the same way, not exactly in the same kind of conditions, but more or less, uh, less the same amount of time they spent in their uh, factories, the same amount of time the Chinese people spend today. Workforce from uh, Wenzhou. Wenzhou is a city which is apparently very similar to Prato. In terms of structure, it's based, based on uh, small factories, uh, artisan industry. So they found exactly the same kind of environment they could grow their small businesses. Prato is next to Florence, as you saw yesterday. So this is from, taken from Google map. Uh, 30 kilometers out of Florence. The common place we have about Tuscany and Florence is uh, old uh, medieval centers and um, nice landscape, good food and good wine. Uh, Prato, in the small center of the city, and uh, it's this area here. That's the old town. You can tell from the color of the roofs. Uh, that's the main square and the cathedral. It has more, more or less the same characteristic of Florence and the other cities of um, Tuscany. But just outside the wall, as Betty mentioned yesterday, we have the Chinese expansion. Everything started within uh, Via Filzi and Via Pistoiese. And all the area, all this area, is basically where everything started in the 80s. And uh, here, this is the Macro Lotto Zero, and Betty spoke about that yesterday too. It's the main place where, uh, the first place people from China bought and transformed into the heart of Chinatown. So let's talk and actually let's see the images because I don't want to go, I don't want to bore you too much with <laughs> words. Uh, this is a photograph taken from one of the tall buildings in, the, in that area between Via Filzi and Via Pistoiese. And what you see in the front is a warehouse with textiles and fabrics inside. This is one of the last typical warehouses uh, from, uh, owned by Italians uh, with um, specialized in recycling uh, textiles and fabrics. Prato was known to be the leader, I would say worldwide, about recycling textiles and creating new textiles like the, the Loden, you know, the green um, coat, uh, was invented in Prato. And all those chimneys, and that's just one, but Prato is full of these chimneys because these are, are small businesses. There was um, just full of smoke every day and all the day long. And that's one of the last places we see in Prato where that work is still kept on. And um, one thing I want to tell you that usually we think that people from China stole the work of Italians, but it's not particularly true, especially at the beginning, because uh, people from Prato recycled fabrics and created textile and fabrics. Chinese people started using those textiles at the beginning and creating new coats and new um, dresses. And they specialize in what is called pronto modo, pronto moda, ready-made fashion. I am Dolce Gabbana, tomorrow I want to have my um, uh, presentation in Paris. I need something right away. I go to Prato and I have that ready in uh, a few hours because they work a lot. And, but then that changed because um, a lot of Italians didn't pay their bills to Chinese, and they started to direct to other places. Two minutes left. Okay, so this is um, uh, Gianni Santososso. You can see next to him, in his garden, you have dormitories here and here of Chinese people, uh, just next to him. And his, uh, uh, his origins are from the south of Italy. 
We saw this image yesterday. It's a symbol of what we usually consider the Chinese invasion. I want to show you that actually, with the end of these slides, that uh, we want to deliver also a good message. It's not just about uh, stealing work, black work, work under the table. There are also elements of integration. Uh, on the walls, you see all these phone numbers. There are prostitutes' phone numbers. I have to tell you that this is a nice story. In the main square of Prato, there, were, there are still prostitutes, and they write their numbers on the walls. And the mayor decided to paint the walls and eliminate all those numbers. The elderly people from Prato, Italian origins, actually complained a lot because those numbers were not there anymore, and they could, take advantage, could not take advantage of, let's, use, let's say, use these um, numbers to make it simple. Uh, one of the um, entrepreneur, Chinese entrepreneurs, you can imagine how complicated it is to, get, to have access to these places because the media focus their attention a lot on these Chinese people and how their work is not according to the rules. So they're always scared that they can find or enhance the bad aspects. We saw this image also yesterday, Macrolotto Zero. All those numbers are prostitute numbers. Uh, the sign at the beginning is, uh, it means Bella Donna, nice woman. And she's one of them in front of uh, these slot machine places uh, in the area of Prato. So let's say these are quite complicated aspects and it's kind of complicated to deal with them in 10 minutes. Uh, but there are efforts of integration. So this is uh, the owner of a bar, I mean, um, a coffee place, and you can have a coffee there with Chinese people and Italian people and other migrants from uh, other places. I would say this is an integration place. They are doing integration action. An Italian uh, um, uh, Chinese uh, working at a hospital, a journalist from uh, the local newspaper, well, uh, Corriere della Sera, it's not a local newspaper, but let's say the local version Wrote, uh, wrote a book on uh, the connection between uh, the crisis between the old uh, Chinese and the young Chinese people and elements of integration. We saw an image similar to this one yesterday of Italians doing Tai Chi with Chinese people in the park. We have also the uh, Catholic Church, the Chinese Catholic Church, and the Buddhist temple doing a lot of uh, integration efforts. The other project, I'm going to be super, super fast, is about a, a young generation. So I photographed these Italians looking like Chinese, but they are Italians, I can tell you. And you saw him yesterday holding the Fiorentina uh, flag, the local football team. And the reason why it's out of focus at the bottom, as someone asked me yesterday, is because I wanted to show that you have to focus your attention on the eyes. And there are no places of integration without people. So that's why the environment is not that important as the facial expression and the focus point. And they are like icons of integration to me. And the bottom of the legs is out of focus to show that their roots are melting with the environment. I'm done. You can see more on the website. Thank you, Francesco. I would 